Hello, this is Dr. Gandhi. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Harold Henthorne? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. This is a fairly unusual case that involves a few distinct incidents. So I'll go over these incidents and then talk about the outcome before moving to my analysis. This case starts in May of 1995. At that time, Harold Henthorne had been married to Sandra Henthorne for about 12 years. She went by the name Lynn. So I will call Lynn Henthorne Lynn, and I'll call Harold Henthorne Henthorne throughout this video. The couple was driving on a remote highway 30 miles from their residence in southwest Denver. Henthorne decided to pull over and change his passenger side front tire on his Jeep Cherokee. He felt that it was flat or running low. The area where they pulled over did not have cell service and it was surrounded by heavy forest. The nearest hospital was 40 minutes away and there were no houses nearby. During their attempts to change the tire, a local mechanic drove by and stopped to help. He not only offered to change the tire, he also offered to shine his headlights on the vehicle. Henthorne only had a small flashlight with him. This was at about 9.30 p.m. Henthorne declined the help of the mechanic, even though later on he would say he didn't know how to change the tire. At about 10 p.m., Henthorne flagged down another vehicle that had multiple occupants. He told the people that his vehicle had fallen on top of his wife. They initially drove away to find a house so they could call 911, but they could not find any place to make a call. They returned to the scene to offer assistance. Two male passengers from that vehicle lifted the Jeep Cherokee enough so that Lynn could be pulled out from under it. She was unconscious, but alive. When they tried to render assistance, Henthorne screamed at them, saying they could not touch her. They decided to render aid anyway. They actually got Lynn breathing using CPR. It was quite cold outside, but Henthorne refused to put his coat over Lynn to keep her warm. One of the passengers used their coat to cover Lynn. As all this was going on, another passenger left the scene and found someone who called 911. Lynn was airlifted by helicopter to a nearby hospital and underwent surgery for internal injuries. She did not survive. There were many problems with this incident. There did not seem to be a great reason to change the tire in such a dangerous spot. The tire they were attempting to change had 15 pounds of air pressure. It was supposed to have 44 pounds. This means it was low, but not flat. He could have certainly operated the vehicle to find a safe place to take care of the tire. They were supposed to put a spare in its place. That spare had air pressure that was also low. It was measured at 19 pounds, again out of 44 pounds. So it wasn't a small spare tire, it was a full-size spare. The three remaining tires on the vehicle ranged from 27 to 30 pounds, so they were low as well. We see a number of inconsistencies in Henthorne's narrative. He told investigators that he used two boat jacks to lift up the car because the jack that came with the vehicle wouldn't work even after he lubricated it. They found nothing at the scene that could be used as lubricant. Henthorne said that Lynn was under the vehicle to retrieve lug nuts, ostensibly after these lug nuts had rolled on the gravel, something that would not really normally happen. On another occasion, he said that she was trying to retrieve the flashlight. If something was under the vehicle, why not reach under the vehicle from the driver's side where the wheel was still mounted? It doesn't make sense to position oneself underneath the wheel hub where the wheel has been removed. There was a clear way to retrieve anything under the vehicle safely, yet for some reason, Lynn chose the most dangerous route. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. Also, one should never go under a vehicle that is supported only by jacks. Jack stands are used for that. And even then, caution is required. For example, they were on gravel, so there was really no safe way to be under that vehicle. As Lynn was under the Jeep Cherokee, Henthorne said that he threw the tire in the back of the car. This caused the vehicle to slip off of the two boat jacks. He alternatively said that the car fell when he closed the rear hatch and it fell when he sat on the back of the vehicle. So we see three different stories here for 
what caused the Jeep Cherokee to move off of the jacks. The police found a footprint near the rear fender, which seemed to offer another possible explanation. Perhaps Henthorn kicked the vehicle off the jacks. Henthorn at one point said that he was the one who freed Lynn and started CPR. This, of course, conflicted with the story of the occupants of the other vehicle. They said they conducted CPR. He couldn't explain clearly if he and Lynn were going to dinner or coming from dinner. This is usually something a person could remember if they thought about it for a moment. For example, he could think about whether he was actually hungry at that moment or not. After Lynn's death, Henthorne insisted that Lynn be cremated immediately. Henthorne collected $600,000 in life insurance from three different policies. One policy had just gone into effect two and a half months prior to Lynn's death. That policy had a rider that doubled the benefit in the case of accidental death. So for that one policy, instead of receiving $150,000, Henthorne received $300,000. The police failed to properly investigate Lynn's death, spending only six days looking at it. They never questioned Henthorne about all his inconsistencies. Lynn's death was ruled accidental. It would appear as though none of these investigators had actually ever changed a tire, or they would have realized that Henthorne's story did not make sense. Five years later, Henthorne remarried. His wife was named Tony. They had met only a year before. This takes us to May of 2011. Henthorne was working on a deck at the couple's vacation cabin near Grand Lake, Colorado. So again, this is Henthorne and his second wife, Tony. A 20-foot wooden beam struck Tony in the back of the neck, injuring her. She had just bent down to pick something up. If she had not done that, the beam would have struck her in the head almost like somebody was directing it at her head. Henthorne offered inconsistent statements about how the beam struck Tony. He initially said that he threw it, then he said that it fell off the deck, and finally, he said that he dropped it when he slipped from a ladder that Tony was holding. So he kind of wove Tony into his story, like maybe she was partially responsible. No investigation took place because the medical personnel who responded claimed that nothing about the accident was suspicious. They did not involve the police. Now we move to September 29, 2012. Henthorn is still married to Tony. For their 12th wedding anniversary, Henthorn took his wife, Tony, to Rocky Mountain National Park. They were going to go for a hike. About 1 p.m., they started climbing the Deer Mountain Trail. It's a six-mile round trip. The trail climbs to an elevation of 10,200 feet. At 3.30 p.m., the pair deviated from the trail to eat at a rocky area about a quarter mile away. At 4.45 p.m., they hiked to another rocky area, again off the trail. This was a 140-foot cliff. After the couple took a few photographs, Tony traveled off of the cliff. This was just before 5.15 p.m. Henthorne first called 911 at 5.54 p.m. He would later say that it took him 15 minutes to reach her body at the base of the cliff and 30 minutes to assess her condition, move her, return to cell coverage, and place the call. Henthorne exchanged a number of calls with the 911 dispatcher prior to the first EMT ranger arriving at the scene at 8 p.m. They found that Tony had died from her injuries. The investigators had a number of problems with Henthorne's story. Here are a few of them. The couple had a dinner reservation for 7 p.m., so the second deviation from the trail right before 5 p.m. would have resulted in them being late. Tony was 50 years old and had recently undergone two surgeries on her knees. Henthorne told a ranger that he and Tony were originally going to go to another trail that was paved and did not have any elevation gain, but because of the crowds, they changed their minds and selected the Deer Mountain Trail, again one that has a marked elevation gain. Henthorne said that he was unfamiliar with the park, but records from his cell phone indicate he had visited the park nine times in the six weeks prior to Tony's death. Henthorne claimed that he was not familiar with the cliff where Tony died, but that didn't seem to be true either. He talked about seeing a white sheet on that cliff, but the park service had removed that sheet a week before her death, so he probably saw that sheet on one of his prior visits and got mixed up. Also, there was a map in Henthorne's car 
that had an X marking the spot where Tony fell. Henthorne told some people that he did not see Tony fall, but he told others that he saw a blur when he was reading text messages. So she was in his peripheral vision when she fell off. He told some people that Tony had wandered too close to the edge when she was checking text messages, but to others he said that she was taking pictures when she slipped. Henthorne's communications also raised red flags. During one 911 call that started at 6.54 p.m., dispatchers were trying to direct Henthorne to conduct CPR, but they did not believe he was actually performing it. Later, the medical examiner would find no signs of injuries associated with the performance of CPR, like abrasions, contusions, or interior rib fractures. So when examining Tony, it didn't look like anybody had performed CPR on her. Her lipstick was also undisturbed. Not even four minutes into one of the calls, Henthorne said he had to turn his phone off as he was running out of battery power. Yet, after hanging up on the 911 dispatcher, he made another 22 calls and sent and received 98 text messages. Not long before Tony's death, Henthorne had taken out several large life insurance policies. He had also changed an existing life insurance policy. He made himself the beneficiary when originally the couple's daughter was the beneficiary. Tony's death looks suspicious, but when considering the incident with the beam in May of 2011 and the death of Lynn Henthorne in May of 1995, the pieces really seem to be coming together. It appeared as though Henthorne could have killed both women. He was arrested and charged for first-degree murder in connection with the death of Tony. He was convicted of first-degree murder in 2015 and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He appealed his case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, but his appeal was denied. Now moving to my analysis. When weighing the evidence from all three incidents, the one involving Lynn and the two involving Tony, it seems fairly clear that Henthorne is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt in connection with Tony's death. He was never tried for Lynn's death, but I think it's clear what happened there as well. There's no way to know for sure, of course. After Tony's death, there was an effort to reconstruct the events of Lynn's death, like to reproduce the circumstances where the vehicle could have fallen on her, the Jeep Cherokee. Investigators were unable to recreate that incident using any of the methods that Henthorne described like throwing the tire in the back of the vehicle, sitting on the back of the vehicle, or closing the rear hatch. They were able to get the Jeep to fall off the jack by pushing the fender with their foot. So that method worked, but again, the other methods did not. This didn't look good for Hanthorn. Now, some have argued that the two deaths were not similar enough so that Lynn's death could be used in the murder trial for Tony's death. Like this would bias the jury and it really didn't represent any type of pattern. Again, the similarity was minimal. But there were actually many similarities, including both women were Henthorne's wives. Lynn's death occurred after 13 years of marriage, Tony's after 12. Both occurred in remote locations. Both women were doing something they would not ordinarily do. Lynn climbed under a vehicle wearing a nice sweater. Tony was hiking after just having surgery on her knees. In both incidents, there was only one witness, Henthorne. Both incidents were bizarre in nature. They were low probability events. You don't hear of people being crushed by cars all the time or falling off cliffs all the time. When these things happen, they really stand out. When you see two happen connected to the same person, that does look quite suspicious. Henthorne demanded cremation for both Wynn and Tony and demanded it immediately after their deaths. Both resulted in significant insurance benefit payouts. Both were associated with inconsistent narratives from Henthorne. I think it's reasonable that the jury was allowed to consider both incidents when trying to decide if Henthorne murdered Tony. Let's take a look at the relationship between Henthorne and Tony. Tony would describe Henthorne as smart, romantic, and kind. Interestingly, Tony was extremely intelligent herself. She was a physician and a surgeon. She worked as an ophthalmologist. Even with this intelligence, Henthorne was able to manipulate Tony easily. This really speaks to how dangerous the powers of manipulation can be. Intelligence does not necessarily make someone immune to those abilities. Their relationship started off with a lot of excitement and romance, but over time, 
Henthorne became controlling and demanding. For example, he would try to prevent Tony's family members from talking to her on the phone. He started to become more involved in her practice as well, even sitting in on meetings, even though he was not connected to that industry in any way. The people who worked with her described Henthorne as creepy. There are some indications that Henthorne's relationship with Lynn was a lot like his relationship with Tony. For example, we see a lot of romance in the beginning. Something that really stands out as far as Henthorne's personality is his affinity for deception. Often people lie for material gain, like to get something that they don't deserve or they're not allowed to get. But sometimes people lie simply to impress people. Henthorne appeared to be doing both. Other than the lies I've already talked about, which were mostly restricted to when the investigations were taking place, we see other deception on the part of Henthorne, changes that he made to his stories even years after the events. For example, regarding Lynn's death, he came up with many stories years later. She was bending over the trunk when the hatch fell on her neck and killed her. A lug nut shot out and penetrated her chest, going through her lung. The helicopter that airlifted her to the hospital depressurized and her lungs collapsed. She was killed in a head-on collision. And finally, when he was talking to a Sunday school class, he said that she died from cancer. He was just one step away from stories of alien abduction. Now, I can understand how people forget the details of traumatic incidents, but how could he get from a vehicle-related death to cancer? That's a lot to forget. There is the sense that Henthorne simply couldn't stop lying. Perhaps he just had a predisposition to lie regardless of motivation. He lied to get what he wanted, but he also, again, lied to impress people, or perhaps to gain sympathy. When his deceptive behavior combined with greed, indifference to human life, callousness, and a lack of empathy, the result was murder. Henthorne appeared to have limitless confidence in himself, and he believed that other people were incredibly gullible. His lies were obvious. When he was not properly investigated for Lynn's death, this probably only made him more confident that other people had no idea what they were doing. He thought he could get away with anything, even a poorly disguised murder plot. He could not see things from the perspectives of others, like he didn't realize how suspicious it looked that he would lose two wives under these bizarre and unusual circumstances. What lesson can be learned from this case? Well, I think there's a lesson here about trust and being careful around suspicious circumstances. One of the frightening things about this case is that from the victim's perspective, this was difficult to prevent. People usually trust their spouses. There were a few clues that something was going on here, though. The intense romance followed by controlling behavior. This is a classic pattern we see with individuals who have narcissistic characteristics. Taking out insurance policies without telling the person who is insured and making changes to those policies without consulting the insured. Creating a situation where the couple was alone in a remote area and violating boundaries. For example, a husband asking a wife to climb under a precariously positioned vehicle on a dark remote road or to go on a hiking trip after knee surgery. Somewhere along the way, people simply became objects from the point of view of Harold Henthorne. There was no true attachment. It was all just perceived utility. When he decided that Tony was more valuable dead, he acted on that thought, unaffected by love or compassion. So we do see a frightening circumstance here, as I mentioned, where you have a relationship that seems to be good, seems to be romantic and pro-social and productive, but then it, of course, turns out that that was not true. How can somebody detect when they're being manipulated? How can somebody see through circumstances like this and say, wait a second, something's wrong? Well, as I mentioned, one of the keys is looking for boundary violations. They're not permissible really in any type of relationship. They're a violation because they're doing something unexpected and wrong, something that infringes on the rights of the other person. So even though people tend to dismiss small boundary violations, like they're no big deal, they could be indicating a larger problem. Those are my thoughts on the case of Harold Henthorne. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. 
As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.